Today, I'm having a conversation with one of the top yacht brokers in the world, Mark Elliott. But when I originally met Mark about 25 years ago in Miami, he was in charge of a fleet of vessels in Miami as a charter boat captain and a charter fleet captain. And he actually uh, had been commander of 14 vessels uh, for the same owner, which he's gonna tell us about. And one of the vessels, as it turns out, was uh, renamed after they sold it. It became Nadine and it became uh, rather famous in a film called The Wolf of Wall Street. And Mark has a uh, very relevant first-hand experience with that vessel, and I'm looking forward to talking about the special effects that were in the film and uh, about what really happened on that uh, fateful night uh, off of the coast of Italy. Um, Mark is in uh, here in Newport, but in another location, and we're going to connect with him now. Good afternoon, Mark. Good to see you. We're both in Newport, but we're not in the same room because uh, we don't do that anymore. For now, anyway. Yeah, yeah, for the moment. But uh, there are a lot of boats up here and a lot of action. I know there's uh, been talking to some captains in the harbor and there's plenty going on. And I know you're a busy guy and at the airport uh, next door to me, you're buzzing in and out on different craft. What have you got over there? Well, that's my little playground. <laughs> and. I've got a helicopter, a Belgian Ranger, a seaplane, uh, an amphibian, and uh, a twin Cessna sitting there now. <laughs> My God, that's probably half the planes at that airport. I've been at that airport longer than anybody, and I love that little airport. It's just a sweet spot, and it's the only way I could have an office out in Nantucket. Um, to be able to fly back and forth to Nantucket is a, a, a game changer as far as if you had to drive out there or get there any other way, it's an all-day affair but flying out there is 30 minutes. To back up, I was, um, I think I met you about more than 20 years ago on the uh, docks in Miami at the Jockey Club when you were running quite an impressive fleet of boats for Bernie Little. Um, but before we get to that, how did you become a captain so young with all these boats? Because I, I just seeing that you 18 years old running a boat up to Alaska from Miami, it's kind of unusual. Yeah, I grew up in Miami. Um, I started sailing boats when I was six years old on a little lake that we lived on in South Miami. And so at a very early age, I was sailing a sunfish and we had a little boat called a midi. And my father was into fishing and he had ski boats. So we grew up on the water and I always kind of knew I wanted to do something on the water. So all through high school, I was doing deliveries and racing sailing boats. And then I finally got a few deliveries as captain, bringing boats over to Bimini. And uh, well, I was very young. And then I got really lucky. I had put an ad up on a bulletin board over at one of the yacht clubs, Coral Gables and uh, Coconut Grove Yacht Club. And this guy called me and said, how'd you like to bring my boat to Alaska? And I said, sure. I didn't even know how to get there. <laughs> so I said yes, and two of my high school friends, we started out, and the oh. <laughs> first leg of the trip was when we were, you know, basically 16, and we went over to the Bahamas, then uh, came back, and he said, okay, let's take it through the canal and up to Alaska, so. So you showed up at the Coast Guard, you know, barely shaving and uh, get, <laughs> getting a big ticket. Well, it wasn't a big ticket then, but now, um, you, you know, it's all about sea time. That led you... Also, at, at a you know at a fairly young age, um, you know suddenly you were in the employment of a very interesting owner. Well, I had always wanted to meet Bernie. I had heard about him, and it was kind of funny how I had met him. I um, we all knew who he was. He was the only big yacht guy moving big boats around at the time, and you know fed ships. That was the dream boat, and I had been on a boat called Gulf Streamer One, and. I had heard that Bernie Little was at Cat Key the day I was docking the boat. So I did this. I knew I had to impress him because he was standing on the dock and we all knew who he was. So I did this beautiful docking. And this was a boat that only had one rudder, no bow thruster, no rub rails. And it was very difficult, deep draft. And I remember we did a perfect docking and Bernie yelled, hey, Captain, come here. I want to meet you. So I ran down the boat as fast as I could. And was running so fast that I hit my head on one of the overheads and knocked myself silly out back. I saw birds, you know, and I was just out flat and I jumped up and I was like, oh my God, Mr. Little, I've been dying to meet you. And I had this big knot on my forehead. 
and the rest was history. He, he hired me and, um, you know, over the next 18 years, I was on and off with him on all kinds of different projects. I mean, he, he had, uh, well, didn't he have Miss Budweiser? Wasn't that basically? Well, he started, um, he had bought Guy Lombardo's hydroplane and he had it up, <clears throat> I want to say, uh, on one of the northern lakes and he was doing a race and he was lucky enough to run to August Bush who he took for a ride and August was very impressed and Bernie asked him for a $5,000 sponsorship. So that, that started a very long relationship with Budweiser and Bernie Little. So when Bernie, you know, after years of racing the hydroplanes, Bernie became the toy guy. So Bernie loved jets and yachts and cars. And, and, um, and so August Bush was, um, happy to charter all these yachts from Bernie and entertain the wholesalers and distributors around the United States. And all those yachts were called Big Eagle. And I think there was a total of 14 different ones that I ran. Um, oh. Everything from Broward's to Fed ships to Benetti's to, to odd builds. And um, so I had the pleasure of doing about a boat a year with Bernie, sometimes running two boats at the same time. And we would fix them up and sell them and flip them, and then I would be on to the next one. And um, so it was very exciting times with Bernie. You know, you're still a young man, but that only covers probably half your half your career because then you were a founder, I believe, of uh, IYC. I wasn't uh, the founder, but I started with the um, idea of one of the last yachts that I was captain of before I retired my captain's uh, wings was – a boat called Starship, and it was half owned by uh, yes. Wayne and Heisinga and Bernie Little. And with the Wayne Heisinga connection, when I wanted to retire as a captain, his nephew, Steve Hudson, owned Pinnacle Yacht Sales, which became International Yacht Collection, and I decided to partner with him. So I opened up an office in Newport, Rhode Island, and one in St. Martin. Looking around on the website there of IYC, which I hadn't been on for a while, and uh... They have uh, they have these articles about you winning these awards for selling boats, and you I mean you, my God, I, I don't know how you sell that many boats in a year. But you've been uh, you've had some really good years. And I've been lucky. Good for you. I know it's, there's nothing luck about it. It's uh, you know I know well, as me, well as luck, anybody. Man. It's it's hard work. Well, I was going to say luck is when preparation meets opportunity, and the harder I work, the luckier I get. So it's all about hard work to me. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you, you can have the listings and the boats, and you get all these uh, uh, dreamy-eyed people that call up and want to talk for hours. But uh, to actually get the deal done is an art form. You also you have a lifestyle that uh, everybody envies because you're in St. Martin in the winters, and then you're in Newport and Nantucket, and you've got uh, all these uh, wonderful toys. You're well, that's all different airplanes. And around work. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I'm here and in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean not so much, I kind of pulled out since Irene, the hurricane. Um, but it's all about work. I follow the yachts. You know, if you want to make money, follow the money. So I follow the yachts. Yeah, it's brilliant. I remember when you set up in St. Martin, it seemed you had a, a like a tiki hut and a barbecue somewhere down in that main marina. And, uh, it was brilliant because there, I, you know, as far as I know, there were no other serious brokers down there at all. So no, and I had experienced that area as a captain, and I knew mm -hmm. the congregation of the yachts in St. Martin was huge. You know, and especially boats that never came to the United States; they would come from Europe and the Med and come to the Caribbean for their winter season. And um, Pretty much, you know, other than Antigua, St. Martin has been the hub. So tell me about what you got up here in Newport. You've got some uh, pretty good looking boats right in the harbor here. Yeah, There's yeah, there. no, I, um, a, a number of my listings are here. I've got M4, which is a Trident. I've got Aspen Alternative, which is a Trinity. I've got uh, Far From It, which is a Richmond, all in the New England area for the summer. And um, amongst other boats we have in our charter fleet, but those are some of the boats that I have for sale up here. So this one is one more toy, Christensen. One, yep, one more toy is down in Fort Lauderdale, having the engines completely rebuilt. And that's a great layout for charter. It's six staterooms, elevator, um, very nice boat. And that'll be like brand new when she gets out of the shipyard period this time. Yep, far from it is up here. She's out in um, Nantucket right now. 
She's also a six stateroom layout, a little flexible layout, beautiful interior, and um, built by Richmond Marine. Built in Vancouver, Don Davis bought uh, the yard because he was trying to build his first yacht called Status Quo there. And um, he couldn't complete the yacht without buying the yard. So he bought the yard and consequently built eight other boats there. And uh, they build a really nice product. It's all fiberglass and a great layout. Aspen Alternative is the last of the 50 meter Trinity is built by Trinity. Uh -huh. um, absolutely stunning woodwork. It has a lighter, more modern interior than most all the other Trinities. That particular owner, that was his third Trinity. So he knew what he was building, how to build it, and um, pretty much nailed it. It's a beautiful, stunning, modern uh, yacht. And she is out in Nantucket right now. I hear rumors all the time that Trinity's going to reappear. With you, with One can only hope. Um, we really do need another manufacturer to step into the marketplace in the U.S. Yeah, you got Westport uh, is still putting them out, but yeah, um, Westport's doing great. Um, Jim Gilbert's is, Jim Gilbert's got Christensen. They're they're trying to get uh, tooled up in Tennessee or someplace. But is that taking shape? I'm not sure how all that's going to work out. I know they had some height restrictions and some draft issues. Um, for the bigger boats they intended to build up there. But I hope they come uh, to the rescue soon because we need more U.S. boat builders. All right, well, I have a loop here uh, from the Wolf of Wall Street. And um, I knew of your involvement, obviously. But um, I, I've sort of been studying the special effects. And, and uh, having I didn't work with Wolfgang Peterson, but uh, I was put in touch with him. So, uh, you know, he did Dust Boot, and then he did The Perfect Storm. The consensus seemed to be that they probably had run up a wave and flipped. Nobody will ever know. But the My own experience on the old Nadine, um, which was a Big Eagle, uh, and um, Jordan was our charter client on Big Eagle, and he ended up buying the boat. Um, but the rogue wave that really you know, did a lot of the damage in the first round, from the bottom of the trough to the top of the wave, had to be 60 feet on that first bad rogue wave. And then we had multiple rogue waves after that, where I actually had to use the engine power to drive up the face of the wave so we didn't slide back or, or broach. And then at the top, as you peek up and over the top, you have to pull it back and don't go too fast uh, as she lets down on the backside of the wave. So I can see how definitely conceivable. I mean, we were very, very fortunate to uh, survive those kind of waves. So here, what I did, I just cut out, I cut out the uh, acting part and just did their, um, just did their special effects. Did, were you involved in advising them technically? Was this a, a no. model in a tank or what was this? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty much a straightforward guy. And in the movie, there was a lot of um, sensationalism and some embellishment of the truth um, to make a good story. Yeah. I always say, why let the truth get in the way of a good story? So, yeah, there was tremendous waves and, you know, similar to what you're seeing in the movie, but in actuality, the, the first rogue wave broke our doghouse on the bow. And that yes. sliding wooden doghouse splintered inward due to the waves and the pressure. When that happened, the bow of the boat filled up with water. And that had a very long bow. So there's about 60 feet of the front of the boat that was basically crew quarters that was flooded. So we had mm -hmm. to dog down the crew quarters hatch and seal that off. But that had lowered the bow just enough or, or enough. So now we had green water waves coming over the bow and hit the dining room window. And what sank Nadine was the dining room windows that got broken. We had one of the bow dinghies break off and actually come in and break the dining room windows. Now we had green water coming in through the dining room windows and swirling down the staircases into the state rooms. So the boat literally sank from the top down, not you know from the bottom up like most people would think of a sink. Okay, so the so it was the main deck windows, not not the uh, the bridge. Correct. The bridge it glass was, didn't cave correct. in. And um, we never lost steering. We had perfect engines and engine power throughout, so I could steer the mm -hmm. boat up and over the waves. Um, so, but the staterooms all got flooded, and that's where the danger, dangerous situation came from. They made an exciting scene with their uh, graphics there, or however they did it. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm not sure 
how much is uh, modeling and how much is uh, CGI, but uh, exciting so stuff. Uh, let's talk about um, yachting in the age of COVID uh, right now with the charter business. And I, I know there are a lot of boats out and I hear that in the harbor, some boats have got eight weeks of charter. They're, they're doing a full season here. Yeah, we had um, an enormous amount of cancellations early on. We pretty much canceled all of our European charters. And then what we saw is people wanted to go anywhere they could out of the COVID danger. So the Bahamas was one of the first areas. Actually, the Florida Keys was the first area. We saw a huge influx of boats down to Key West and all through the Keys, the ones that were legal to charter in the U.S. were taking on charters because people, after they were pent up at their house and their kids, they all wanted to get out and breathe. And so we've got clients that had never chartered before chartering because they they see it's a very safe way to bring their family out on a great adventure and not be with a huge crowd of people. And the yacht crews are very, very conscious. Um, it's their home. So when you come into their home, they're sanitizing everything. They're testing everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And we did have a number of yachts that were down in the Caribbean that would have normally gone back to Europe that came up to the U.S. to hunker down for COVID. And those boats are now up here in New England, and that's what you're seeing in Newport, are mega giga yachts that have never yeah, been here before. Yeah, much much larger yachts than we're used to. We usually yeah. get a few, but um, there's a very impressive fleet here. And are they, um, I, I've heard they're over in Mackerel Cove, and they, uh, Sag Harbor, they're, they're going to places that maybe are a little less populated and spending the day doing water sports and not uh, probably not doing as much uh, shopping and That's restaurants. That's exactly right. Where normally you'd have people going out to dinner from the yachts, they're all eating on board. It's the safest place for them. Um, we've got a lot of yachts up in Maine right now getting away from it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the, there's yachts in Mackerel Cove that we've never seen before. You know, Sag Harbor and Nantucket have always been popular um, and the vineyard. Um, but I think you've just got boats and people who, who want to stay safe. They want to stay close to home. They don't want to travel internationally. So mm -hmm. New England is the spot this summer. What's the prognosis for this winter? Um, I talked to one port agent. It sounds like they're scrambling to find ways to, that yachts can visit different islands and different parts of the Caribbean. Yeah, I, I think the Caribbean will be open. Um, Certainly yachts pose a minimal threat to spreading COVID just because everybody is staying on board and how careful they are. So if I was a government official, I would certainly welcome the private yachts as opposed to, um, you know, the masses of people Yeah, because it still brings a tremendous amount of revenue to whatever area the yachts cruise in, whether you're selling flowers, groceries, or supplies, yachts bring a lot of revenue. So I think they'll find ways for the private yachts to be in the Caribbean. Um, I'm more concerned with the Fort Lauderdale boat show to tell you the truth. So they're, they're trying hard to uh, keep those doors open, I suppose. I believe so. But my personal feeling, it's going to be very difficult with what's going on in Florida to have a successful boat show with the COVID rate that's going on right now. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, that certainly, uh, Maybe do it as a private show or something, but um, it looks a little like a county fair, the uh, numbers of people they get. Well, we'll hope for the best. Well, thank you for chatting with us. Well, thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk soon. That concludes today's podcast from the Yacht Channel. Uh, there will be links that you'll see below here to get in touch with Mark or to look at any of his boats. You can also hit on the subscribe button if you'd like to see more of these podcasts. And we look forward to seeing you next week.